Good evening, everybody. Good afternoon. Good morning, uh, wherever you are in the world. Um, so my name is uh, Jacob Klein. I'm the chair currently of the SOAS uh, Food Study Center. Um, and this is our first uh, uh, paper, our first seminar in the Food Forum series for the 2021-2022 uh, academic year. Uh, it's a, uh, so welcome everyone. It's a huge uh, uh, privilege and pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Professor Brian Dot. Uh, let's see. Uh, so Professor Dot is Chair of History and of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies um, in, uh, at, at Whitman College in um, Washington State in the United States. Uh, he is a cultural historian uh, of China. He, he is the author of Identity Reflections, Pilgrimages, to Mount Tai in late imperial China um, from 2004. Uh, and most recently, he has published this uh, wonderful book uh, called The Chili Pepper in China, a cultural biography published with Columbia University Press in 2020. Um, I read it um, over the summer and immediately um, invited uh, Professor Dot to this seminar series because I thought it was such a a fabulous book. Um, so it's a really great pleasure to have him here. Um, what we'll do is, uh, for those of you who haven't been to the seminar before, um, so uh, we'll have uh, Professor Dot will give us his paper first, um, and after the paper there'll be time for Q and A. Um, if I could ask you all to, in the first instance, use the raise hand function, which you'll find at the bottom of your screens, um, and I'll then call upon you to ask your question. Um, but if you don't uh, feel uh, if you feel a bit uncomfortable, or you for whatever reason you have a bad, um, uh, you know, problems with your Wi-Fi, and you don't want to um, speak your, you know, uh, you don't want to ask your question out loud, you can also type it into the chat. So I will be looking at the chat from time to time as well. But I prefer it if people could, in the first instance, um, actually raise their hand and ask their question out loud. If that's all right. Um, so uh, without further ado, then I'll hand over to hand it over to uh, Brian, uh, Professor Dot. and mute myself as well. All right, so can, hopefully you can see the full screen of, of the PowerPoint. Okay, excellent. Looks great, yeah. Uh, oh, there's my view, okay. I wanted to make sure I could actually see people. It's nice this this format. I've done webinars where I can't actually see any members of the audience. <laughs> this is nice. Um, so uh, I'm excited to talk with you about the history of the chili pepper in China and the various ways that the Chinese adopted and adapted the the chili pepper to fit their culture, our cultures. Um, so um, let me just get. Here we go. Um, so my sort of overall question that I had asked myself at the beginning of this project was, you know, how did chilies come to be used daily in China? Um, it sort of struck me as an epiphany at one point when I was eating at a, a Sichuan restaurant in Beijing and just wondering how did the Chinese start eating something that's so different? Um, typically, it, it, cuisine can, can be a fairly conservative aspect of culture. So how did this really intense flavor become so popular that today many Chinese just assume it's an indigenous crop? Um, and so, I mean, the, the very basic answer to that is that the Chinese rec recognized and exploited the versatility of the chili pepper. Whoops. And that's sort of my, what I'm gonna do today is give a broad overview and show you the many different areas that, that, that the Chinese used the chili pepper. Um, so just briefly, I'll be begin with some background, how the chili pepper got to China, um, and then go through these different categories of, of ways it was used as a decorative plant, as a flavoring, um, 
as a vegetable, which I see as distinct from use as a flavoring, although it's obviously also doing that function. Uh, medicine, um, it also gets used in, in literary imagery. Um, and then if I've still got time when I get there, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the regionalization and, and how that's a really important, the different regions in China have different cultures and environments and that, that those can influence the way the chili pepper gets used in specific areas. Um, so the chili pepper uh, originated in Central America and Northern South America. Um, so it's not anywhere outside of the Americas until Columbus. So I, I like to say this is the one, perhaps the one good thing that Columbus did was to help spread the chili pepper. Um, so it's also important, one of the reasons I can't give you a super precise trajectory for how the chili peppers exactly got to China is the chilies were not a world trade commodity until the 20th century. Um, so I can't go back to ship manifests like one can do for nutmeg or black pepper or something like that. Um, probably the chili first got to Europe into Spain uh, after Columbus's second voyage. So probably arrived there in 1494. Um, and then we know they got to India, and this would have been the Portuguese bringing it to India around 1530, um, Malacca, modern day Indonesia around 1540, and then somehow got to China. Um, so, actually, let me go back a sec. Um, we know they got to Southeast Asia via the Portuguese through the Indian Ocean. Eventually, we're also going to get the Spanish um, bringing the chilies across from Acapulco to Manila and the so-called Manila galleons. Um, and one thing I want to point out is we've got no record that any of these introductions were because they were bringing crates and crates full of chili peppers. So I'm I'm pretty sure, but again, you know, there's just no direct evidence, but I'm pretty sure that what happened was the crew members, some of the crew members on these ships brought chili peppers for their own food. And that that's the way the chilies got spread when they got to various ports of call. Um, so we get chilies in Southeast Asia coming there from both the Indian Ocean Basin, and then also across the Pacific from modern day Mexico. Um, and then we've got uh, three entry points into China at, at different, slightly different periods. Um, and the, the main evidence that I use, and, and also some Chinese scholars have used for identifying these entry points, is that in those places, they used a different name for the chili pepper. So the argument I'm making and, and, the, and the Chinese historians are making is that it was a new crop and they had to invent a name for it. And that's why you have different, one of the reasons why you have different names in these three regions is that those were uh, entry points for the chili. Overall, we end up with a lot, a lot of, of different names in Chinese for the chili pepper, which I think is a reflection of regionalization, regional differences in how the chilies were used. Um, so the earliest known record for the chili peppers is from 1591 uh, in Zhejiang province um, on the coast. And that name is foreign pepper. So they recognized that it was coming from abroad. Um, we also get then, and it's, it's arriving there probably prior to that, my best guess is 1570s. Um, but it, you know, it could be 1580s. Uh, and then up in the north, um, 
this map doesn't have it. The, the Korean Peninsula is right, right here. Um, so in the north in Shenzhen, the earliest reference is 1682. Um, but we have earlier, ref I found earlier references for, for Korea. Um, and so it seems likely that that introduction is sort of farmer to farmer working its way up the Korean Peninsula and then across into China in the 1650s. And then Taiwan is a, a separate introduction point um, in this, later in the 1640s. And that's almost certainly introduced by the Dutch um, during their short period when they were colonizing in Taiwan. And there, the locals called it foreign ginger, um, which implies the particularly the, the um, foreign pepper, chin pepper, I'm going to get there in a minute, are, are using a character that already existed in Chinese for another pungent flavoring. So I think part of what's going on is an, a signal to how they were using the chili in similar ways to that indigenous Sichuan pepper, or in the case of Taiwan, similar to their use of ginger. Um, so elite were initially using the chili as a decorative plant, which is a really interesting parallel because in Spain, when the chili peppers are first introduced, nobody's eating them there. Um, there are actually records of them as a decorative plant in monastery gardens. Um, so the elite in China are similarly using it as a decorative plant. It works really well uh, within Chinese culture. Red is a celebratory color. A shiny red is really great. And then shiny red juxtaposed to those dark green leaves is just a really nice uh, contrast. Um, and the earliest text, I believe, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrates that this author, Gaolian, was indeed treating them as a decorative plant. Um, we'll first look at, this is his whole text uh, about chili peppers. And this is actually a pretty long text for, for the time period, uh, you know, prior to the 20th century. This was a long text for me for, for, for finding out about chili peppers in China. Um, so foreign pepper, that's the name that he uh, comes up with. The plant has dense growth. The flowers are white. The fruits are just like the worn out tip of a writing brush. Their flavor is spicy, la. Their color is red. They are very pleasing to look at propagation results from planting the seeds. So it's a fairly scientific description of the plant. He does mention that the flavor is spicy, but based on where he placed this description, this is a super long work. Um, he's got a couple of different sections about food. He has a big long discussion of medicine and the chili peppers are not in any of those sections. Instead, they're in a section on decorative plants. Um, and then we have subsequent sources, including one from not much later, 30 years later. People plant them in pots as decorations. And then a, you know, a, later, a later one from the 19th century, they are shiny and radiant. Many are raised in pots for decoration. And there, there's certainly some continued use today of, of chili peppers as a, as a decorative plant. Um, and then also they get used decoratively. This is a very recent, uh, probably 21st century use of the chilies as a decoration. They tend to be artificial chilies, but you could certainly hang strings of, of chilies. And, and in the past, there has been lots of people hanging strings of, of chilies uh, next to doors, but this, uh, sort of wish or prayer for the New Year's is a fairly, and, and using these decorative artificial chilies is, is quite recent. Um, so the, the phrase in Chinese, hong hong huo huo, literally means red, red, fire, fire. Um, so in, 
the color and the intensity of the flavoring, but it becomes really a wish or a prayer for an exuberant and prosperous life. And they're most commonly hung, uh, in this case, it's a, it's a little hostel, um, and, and on either side of the doorway, and, and typically people will also put them on either side of the door to their apartment or to their house at Chinese New Year um, as a way of, of making wishes for, for the coming year for, for prosperity for the family or for the business. Um, so moving on to looking at chilies as flavoring, the initial records, um, so looking say the 17th century into the 18th century, it's being used, they're being used often as a, initially as a substitute for other flavors. So this is how it sort of gets its entry into culinary use as a substitute. And then over time it becomes used on its own. Um, so let's start with the naming regimen. Um, there's a really interesting parallel between the Chinese and English in this context. Um, the English, we use the word pepper for all sorts of different plants that are completely unrelated to each other. And the Chinese are using a, doing a similar sort of thing. Um, the, the point that we're starting from is different. In English, we're starting with black pepper and then carrying that name to other plants as they get introduced. For, for the Chinese, the original name is for indigenous plant, often known as Sichuan pepper or flower pepper. Um, the character Zhao, originally, that, that's what that means. It's, the, it's that plant, and it's particularly the seed pod from that plant that gets used as a flavoring. Um, it's in the prickly ash family. It's a small perennial tree. Um, it has a really strong pungent flavor, but also has a really interesting numbing uh, aspect to it, quality to it. Um, the black pepper is the next pepper <laughs> to be introduced into China. Um, that's coming from South Asia. That's a perennial vine, so completely different kind of plant in a completely different family. Um, and the hu in front of the jiao, so hu jiao is, the hu means foreign, it means India, it means much of Asia outside of China. Um, so it's sort of a demarker of this is a jiao, not from China. Um, and then the chili pepper, the initial name that uh, Gaolian uses is another character fan for foreign. Um, and then it also eventually becomes most commonly known as la jiao, which is spicy pepper. Um, so they're using that core character from the indigenous pungent flavored plant and then modifying it to identify a new uh, plant that's being introduced to China. All right, so in the substitutions, there's three main sort of rivals or three things that the chili pepper is, is being substituted for, which really gets it its adaptation and adoption in China taking off. Um, so indigenous Sichuan pepper is widely available throughout China, but generally purchased at a market. Um, since it's a small tree, it takes up really too much space to be planted in someone's kitchen or, or vegetable garden. Um, it, so we have this uh, a quote from 1671, the chili pepper can be substituted for Sichuan pepper. Um, similar sorts of things for black pepper. Um, in terms of economics, there's an even bigger gap. Um, so one of the things that makes the chili pepper spread so well across the world is it's a temperate, you know, it, it will grow in a temperate climate. Um, so it will grow a lot of different places, which is a real contrast to the, the spice trade spices 
like nutmeg or cinnamon or black pepper, which really need a, a tropical or semi-tropical climate. Um, so since black pepper is actually imported from South Asia, it, it makes it a lot more expensive. And so something that you're growing basically at the cost of your labor is going to be way cheaper economically uh, than, than the black pepper and, you know, a little bit cheaper than the Sichuan pepper. So ground very fine. Uh, chili peppers are used in the winter months as a substitute for black peppers. The implication being that black pepper is harder to obtain in the winter months. Um, now, interestingly, so black pepper, let me go back a second. The Sichuan pepper, black pepper are, can, are in the same flavor group for the Chinese, but salt is a completely separate flavor group and would not be, it's not sort of a natural substitution because you're not substituting one pungent flavor for another pungent flavor. In this case, you're substituting pungent flavor for, for salt. Um, but part of the issue that's going on there is definitely economics. So salt, when the chili peppers introduced is a, a government monopoly or semi-monopoly, um, which makes salt somewhat artificially in, inflated in terms of price. Um, and then I think particularly important for the takeoff of the chili pepper is in the 1620s, there are major disruptions in, in the salt trade. Um, and this leads to really dramatic increases in the cost of salt. Um, so we get uh, local gazetteers or local histories that talk about, for example, local minorities use it as a substitute for salt. One of the things going on there is in Guizhou, the local minorities are typically living outside of the political center and are more outside of the monetized economy and makes it harder for them to, to be buying salt. Now, one thing is important to point out here is, of course, the chili peppers cannot substitute for the biological needs of salt. Um, you know, we biologically need um, particularly sodium uh, for various cell functions. And obviously, a chili pepper is not going to be a substitute for that. But as we probably all know, we eat way more salt than we could possibly need biologically. And so chili pepper is, is filling in in that niche of salt as a flavoring rather than salt as a biological necessity. Um, so over time, the chili peppers take on the flavoring of their own, not just a substitute. Um, and we can see this fairly early uh, 1621, the ground fruit is put into food. It is extremely pungent and spicy, but not referring to a direct substitute. But, you know, as we move into the 18th century, it becomes more, less and less common to see substitution. We can see this um, 1765 local history. The pod is sliced and used to flavor food and sauces, vinegar, savory oils, and preserved vegetables. Um, these are really key aspects of Chinese cuisine, um, using sauces and vinegars and savory oils, preserved vegetables. Those are all really common, important components of Chinese cuisine. And the chili pepper is getting integrated into those different uh, flavoring systems. Uh, by the 18th century, we're sort of well beyond substitution. Um, and, and even real emphasis on the importance and the uh, widespread use of the chili pepper. So as indispensable in daily cuisine as onion and garlic, um, it is the most important vegetable in the garden. Um, it is used as a daily flavoring, not unlike salt. Um, so it's really taken off. Um, and by the early 19th century, there are almost no sources that are referring to the chilies anymore as, as a substitute. They've really come into their own as, as a flavoring. Um, 
related to to the use of the flavoring, um, I argue that that introduction and adoption by the Chinese of the chili pepper has changed their the language. Um, so the way the the term la or spicy is used has shifted. So in the 17th century and earlier, uh, la was defined as very pungent, which is sort of somewhat circular <laughs> definition. Um, and then pungent is defined as the flavor of hard metals. Um, and then some examples would from that time period would be scallions, garlic, knotweed, mustard, uh, would all be described as la. Um, I think that, I'm going to show you, I mean, the next definition I have is from a 1990s dictionary, but the, in the sort of spoken language, the shift is definitely happening prior to that. But in that definition, um, we have the sharp and stimulating flavor of ginger, garlic, or chili pepper. So chili peppers worked its way into the definition. And then even more recently, the sharp and stimulating flavor of the chili pepper, garlic, or ginger. So it becomes sort of up at the front. Um, and if we look at sort of modern language use, when somebody is using the term law to talk about flavoring, they almost always mean chili pepper. Um, so just for example, uh, I, I want to eat spicy food uh, um, or I like to eat spicy food. Uh, I don't eat spicy food or eat more commonly, um, I'm afraid of spiciness, um, which means I can't eat spicy food. Um, and the la in all of those is going to be understood as chili pepper, um, not going to be garlic. I'll, I don't know of any Chinese who don't eat garlic, but I do know Chinese who don't eat chili peppers. Um, and, and so that adaptation, adoption of this initial, you know, foreign plant has impacted that aspect of, of language use. Um, so just very briefly, important to mention that, you know, the chilies are not only used in cuisine for flavoring, they are also used uh, as a vegetable. Um, you know, the most, sometimes this would be the really mild peppers like a bell pepper, um, and but other times it would be some that, are, that have some, some spice to them as well. Um, so I looked through a whole lot of local histories or gazetteers um, and most of those uh, tend to categorize things. Um, and in the ones that include the chili pepper, chili peppers put in the vegetable category in over 80% of them. So there's a clear, association with the with the chilies as a vegetable. Um, and botanical texts, similarly, if they're categorized, over 50% of them were categorized into the vegetable category. And then medical texts are using often, often using a different system. And the ones I looked at, only a few of them were using that similar sort of category, but a couple of them, two out of those three used identifying them as a vegetable. Um, just a couple examples. Uh, in his 1848 work on plants, Wu Qijun observed that chilies are grown in Jiangxi, Hunan, Guizhou, and Sichuan, so four different provinces, as a vegetable. And then this is a modern uh, sort of tourism poster trying to uh, explain the culture of, uh, in this case, Shanxi, which is uh, where Xi'an is, is located, the, the, the life-size terracotta warriors. Um, and this is a, they like to talk about a particular region, a particular province having sort of eight to 10 specialties or oddities 
that help distinguish them, their culture from, from neighboring regions cultures. And for this one, the third oddity for Shanxi is that the chili pepper is a complete dish. So you can have an entire dish just made out of chili peppers. As we can see, this woman is, 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 has that nice red dish of, of chili peppers. Um, I think for time's sake, I'm gonna sort of skip this. The, the Chinese, uh, I'll, I'll go through quickly. Um, when I've talked to Chinese, they're like, are you sure there aren't some chilies that are native to China? Um, and it, it's important to point out that no, there aren't any that are native to China, but the Chinese have absolutely bred many unique uh, uh, varieties of, of chili pepper. Um, and so this is a really popular one, uh, Chao Chen Jiao, um, the, the heaven facing chilies um, that grow upwards rather than downwards. Um, this is one that looks like the interesting uh, Buddha hand citrus fruit. Um, it just grows, they just grow in a clump and they're called Buddhist hand chilies. Um, and then this is just a whole variety of chilies in, in, South, in, in a market in Southwest China. Um, but I wanna make sure I've got time to talk about medicine. Um, so in lots of cultures, including Chinese culture, it, it, you can't really draw a line between uh, things that are taken into the body as food versus things that are taken into the body as medicine. Um, and sort of identification of the medicinal uses of chili pepper is I think equally important to its adoption in China as a, its initial use as a substitute flavor. Um, so Within Chinese medicine, we have a system uh, called the five phases, which is very important. Um, this is a, a correlate, correlative or corresponding um, system. Um, there are five phases and then each phase gets associated with all sorts of different things. And this can be used in medicine, but it also gets used in fortune telling and in all sorts of other aspects of Chinese culture. Um, so as you can see, there's a, a direction associated with each phase, a color, a flavor, um, climates, uh, and then different parts of the body, including different types of organs um, and different tissues are all associated with a particular phase. And then, if you're weak in, 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 in your heart, then you might need to take, um, for example, eat things that are in the um, fire phase. Um, and similarly, so the pungent is associated with metal, hence that definition of pungent meaning the taste of hard metals. Um, and then, it gets associated with uh, having drying characteristics uh, or abilities as a medicine, um, targeting the lungs, targeting the, the large intestines, the nose, the skin. Um, so, you know, one in this system, an explanation for why the your nose is running as you're eating lots of chili peppers is, is going to be partly because of that connection of that phase, that metal phase. Um, so 1758, uh, Wang Fu's medical text, he describes a chili pepper, um, the pungent flavor drains off the lungs. So we can see it's pungent flavor. It has that drying capability and in particular can help to dry out excess moisture in the lungs. Um, so once the chili pepper gets placed into that system, people understand how it could be used and that in turn is going to impact its, its use as a flavoring or as a vegetable as well. So 
people might be eating it as a dish, but they're also understanding that it can be impacting their health in a particular way. Um, this is uh, Wu Chi Jun again, talking about another aspect of the uh, uh, chili pepper. So without variety in the diet, illnesses can occur. Lesser ones can be treated with ginger and cassia cinnamon. So those are two other flavors that are in the same pungent category. More severe illnesses of the spleen or stomach must be treated with something stronger, the foreign pepper. So here we're contrasting. So if it's a mild disease, you probably don't want to be prescribing chili pepper. But if those other pungents aren't having an impact, then you can step up the treatment and, and add in chili peppers. Um, another system um, that's really important in terms of Chinese medicine and also in terms of um, flavorings is the yin and yang system. So in this system, there's basically two categories of, of food or uh, can be either cooling or warming. And, you know, this is sort of a no brainer. Obviously, the chili pepper gets put into the warming category. Um, and I'm just going to skip the next one. So, but it, it's important that these things get established and recognized and put into the categories, and then they can be used by medical practitioners. Um, in terms of that heating property, um, in this text, uh, the chili has the property of cold expelling heat. Um, so we can use heat to, to warm the body. It has great pungent and warming properties and thus can cure those with young wind hemorrhoid sores. It guides fire to move downward. Um, and then uh, uh, similarly, even though the chili has a hot characteristic, it can expel heat, sort of the idea of fighting fire with fire. Um, Wu Juyu, uh, which is an indigenous plant, um, has the, the same effect. And, and so one of the things that's important here is the author is pointing to a plant that his readers would be much more familiar with and showing them, oh, okay, so you use Wu Juyu in this particular way. Now you can also use this new plant, the chili pepper in that, in that particular way. Um, in addition to categorizing the chili and putting it into these systems where it would have the you know, effects that you would expect from another pungent plant, but maybe in a more intense way, there's also a whole lot of observed effects that, that work their way into the understanding of the impact of the chili pepper on health. Um, so two of the most important are AIDS digestion, stimulates appetite. Um, if we look at sort of modern uh, biomedicine, there's actually studies that, that show exactly the same thing. Um, the, the capsaicin, the, the spicy element, element or compound in the chili peppers stimulates salvation, um, also stimulates uh, gastric production of gastric juices. Both of those things are going to aid in indigestion and appetite. Um, so we get texts like this fairly early one recognizing this aspect of the chili pepper. Um, they also have uh, chilies that, again, the capsaicin, so the really spicy chilies, uh, have an antiseptic antimicrobial um, aspect to them. Um, and we can get texts like this one where it talks about treat uh, uh, use of it alongside uh, seafood. So it can detoxify poison from aquatic animals. People who eat too much fish or crab and get diarrhea or dropsy can boil the fruit to make a dose of medicinal broth. Um, this one, I don't know that I would recommend trying this, but it's a really interesting. Uh, so sort of as an analgesic, um, 
to 11 or 12, interesting, no, 11 or 12, exactly, uh, spicy eggplant fruits. So that interestingly, they recognize that the uh, chili pepper is in the same family as eggplant. Um, to reduce swelling and stop pain, um, the small blisters at the wound site will expel a yellow liquid and then heal when eating this, the, when eating this, the flavor will be sweet and not spicy. Um, this is a typical understanding in, in Chinese medicine that if your body really needs something, it, it's, it, it will crave it and you won't really notice the intensity of the flavor. Once your body no longer needs it, then, then the flavor, that really intense spicy flavor would, would come back. Um, or masticate and place on the wound to reduce swelling and stop pain. Um, all right, so let me, uh, the chilies also work their way into imagery and literature. Um, the earliest uh, literary references to chilies uh, comes quite early in 1598, um, super famous opera by Tong Shenzhou, uh, the Peony Pavilion. Um, there's an element here where the, where the chili is beginning to be associated with female passion. And this is an, a, a trope that's going to continue all the way up to the present. Um, the Peony Pavilion focuses on romance, passion, sexual frustration, death, and rebirth. Um, the female protagonist, um, Du, du Liniang, or Bridal Du, is an enduring character who has often been held up as a paragon of female passion among readers uh, and in subsequent literary works. In scene 23, Du is in the underworld having her soul judged. Um, her claims about her death result in an underworld judge summoning the flower spirit from a garden where she had had a dream. I'm, there's a lot more to this. <laughs> I'm just going quickly over the story. Um, shortly after this, uh, the author has the flower spirit name 38 flowers with the underworld judge replying in an alternating duet. Um, the judge's replies reflect on some nature of each flower or make a literary reference associated with the flower or pun on the flower's name, and then also uh, brings out some erotic suggestion. Um, so given the importance of flower imagery throughout the work, all the plant names mentioned in this scene by the flower spirit are described as flowers. For a number of them, it's pretty clear that it's, it's just, it's actually some other part of the plant that, that's, that's important. Um, and that's the case for the chili pepper, even though he calls it la jiao hua. Um, and this is actually the very first use of that name, spicy pepper for the chili in Chinese. Um, he is clearly referring to the, the spicy pot. Um, and in his line, um, the, the judge's echoing line for in response to the flower spirit mentioning the, the spicy pepper flower or chili flower, he replies, her welcome is warm. Um, and so we get this first association of the chili pepper with, with female passion. Um, and this is, it's gonna, th there's this association with, with gender, um, with the female gender in this context, um, and it's gonna shift over time. Um, so this is sort of our first example of this trope of, of spicy girls or spicy young women, uh, la maids. Um, uh, Probably one of, one of the more famous ones is going to be the 18th century novel, Dream of the Red Chamber by Cao Shui Qin, um, where we get a strong female character, Wang Shifeng, associated with chilies. Um, 
Her nickname is Feng Lazi or chili pepper Feng. Um, and this is case where her nickname is, is associated with her character. Um, she is uh, very uh, forthright, um, direct and powerful woman in this very elite family. She's chosen by the matriarch to be in charge of the family's finances because of her feisty nature. Um, she is gonna hold tight to those purse strings and, and keep the family spending in, in check. And, and so that association with that sort of feisty uh, character with the chili pepper is continuing that trope of the la maids or the spicy, spicy girl. Um, and then this has become even more developed in, in the late 20th century into the 21st century was the super popular song, La Meza, uh, Spicy Girls, um, made very, very popular by the pop star uh, Song Zhu Ying. Um, and she has sung this several times at this huge national television extravaganza at the, at the Chinese New Year. Um, so national broadcast. And here, here, these are some of the traits that come out in this song. From youth, unafraid of spice, with a handful of chilies, speak their minds. Passion is spicy. When they speak, it's fiery and spicy. That what they do things, it's bold and spicy. When they interact, it's hot and spicy. And this is just a very, um, it's not, I don't, it's definitely not seen as aggressive. It's seen as assertive and uh, independent and going out in the world. Um, they take, you know, they've been eating chili since they were young. And when they go out in the world, they're taking that spiciness they've gotten from the chili peppers and it's helping them to succeed. So it's a, it becomes much more positive in this modern version. There's, there's some negative aspects to it, in, or particularly in the, in the Dream of the Red Chamber. Um, so this very positive aspect, it's typically associated with uh, women from regions where the chili pepper is eaten a lot. So it's most often associated with women from Hunan, um, but also you can see it for women from, from Sichuan as well. Um, there's also uh, male gender tropes. So it's a little less uh, common trope than the, than the La Meza trope. Um, there, but so we do also have examples of the chilies being linked to hypermasculinity, particularly in connection with the communist revolution. Um, there's a, a well-known phrase that's attributed to Mao. Um, and here we can see Mao in this image. It's the, it's the first page when you open this menu uh, of a Hunan restaurant in, in Beijing. Um, so there's a direct correlation between Mao and Hunan and Hunan cuisine. Um, so that phrase is without chili peppers, there would be no revolution. So very direct association of that connection. Um, the origin of this phrase apparently came from one of the many conversations between Mao and the American journalist Edgar Snow in the communist base area in 1936. Um, I'll just give you a couple other examples for, for Mao. Um, so Chili's in Hunan lie at the intersection of food, memory, and identity. The most renowned Hunanese from the recent past, Mao Zedong, is inexorably enmeshed within the identity of Hunanese as consumers of extremely spicy food. In popular accounts, the food Mao ate, hot chili peppers in particular, um, is linked directly with his identity. According to uh, one Hunanese food writer, Mao even put chili flakes on his watermelon. Um, a commonly repeated story about Mao is that a doctor once recommended that he should cut back on his consumption of chilies, to which Mao quipped, 
If you are even afraid of chilies in your bowl, how will you dare attack your enemies? Um, and so we get this image of that ability to eat intense spiciness of the chili pepper is a sign of your ability as a revolutionary, as a fighter. So we get that sort of male trope associated with the chili pepper. All right. Um, how am I doing? Okay. So just briefly mention, uh, I've mentioned it, it as we we're going along that, that sort of regional use of the chili varies. And you certainly see that in the different regional cuisines. Um, so some regions eat very, very spicy food. Some regions in China do not eat spicy at all. Um, and part of that has to do with climate, has to do with uh, earlier cultural traditions. I don't, I don't have time to go in, in in great detail at this point, but I just want to emphasize a couple aspects where we can see this regional use. Um, so, Trenjo on the on the southwest coast in Fujian, um, there's an emphasis on medicine. Um, it cures fish poisoning, um, so it's it's a, a, a medicinal use associated particularly with eating seafood. And that phrase is, I found it in every single source I looked at for Trenjo, um, whereas it's, it's not a common phrase that I found anywhere else. So it's, it's clearly been adapted for that particular region for, for that sort of medicinal use. Um, it also gets used as a treatment for malaria. Um, and it not surprisingly more mentions of it in the in these southern provinces where malaria is more common. Um, but emphasis of it, not just as a treatment for malaria once it's contracted, but actually as a prophylaxis to prevent uh, the getting of malaria, which means there'd be an emphasis on, on more regular use of it. Um, emphasis on expelling moisture or damp. So this is really important all the way up to the present in these three, particularly these three, but probably other, other areas as well, but particularly Hunan, Guizhou, and Sichuan, which have very uh, moist climates in both the summer and the winter. In, in traditional Chinese medicine, uh, it's, it's very important for the body not to be retaining excess moisture. Um, and so chili pepper is seen as an excellent way of helping the body to expel excess moisture. You know, one really obvious way that happens is you're, you're eating something really, really hot and you just sweat a whole bunch. Um, and so, the Suchanese, uh, Guizhou, people from Guizhou, Hunanese, all of them believe, uh, most of them believe that eating chilies is really important for uh, maintaining health throughout the year. And, and some of them might even emphasize it's, it's even more important in the winter time when it's cooler because you're gaining both the heat of the chili as well as its moisture expelling uh, characteristics. All right, so I'll wrap wrapping up uh, the couple of things that, you know, initially the, the uh, using the chili as a substitute for other flavors opens the door for, for Chinese to start integrating the chili pepper uh, into their culture. Um, understanding of how it can be used medicinally is sort of equally important. In, in its spread of use throughout China. And then really importantly is that the Chinese recognized the versatility of the chili and therefore could adapt its use to fit regional cuisine, regional climate, regional environmental factors and, and use the chili uh, in different ways in, in different parts of China. Thank you. Stop.
hearing. Great. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful paper. So, so rich and informative, and there's so many things uh, to follow up on there and lots of, um, lots of things to ask you about there. I've got several questions myself. I will ask one of them uh, whilst uh, we wait for, the, uh, for others uh, to kind of give them, everybody else a, a, a chance to gather their thoughts and ask perhaps uh, better questions than the one that I will ask. Um, so, uh, so I guess I'll, I, I think I'll, I'll ask this question. So uh, I found it really interesting, the your argument that uh, chilies are being spread predominantly by farmers who are uh, growing chilies for their own consumption, uh, perhaps for sharing uh, with neighbors and perhaps for local markets. So I was wondering when and in what context the chili begins to emerge, begins to emerge as more of a commodity and something which is traded perhaps across longer distances. And what do we know about that? Um, sure. Yeah. So I think initially it, it, it spread as, yeah, this sort of farmer to farmer, families to families, um, within uh, market towns, within sort of villages that are linked together through uh, marriage marriage patterns. Um, I think the, the really sort of commercialization of it is, is, the, 20, is the 20th century. Um, and that's when we really start to see, and, and, and sometimes even later 20th century, um, but we, that's where we start to see particular regions growing it and then exporting it to other, you know, initially it's all internal uh, distribution of the chili pepper within China. Um, more recently, there's an ability to export some aspects, either the chili peppers themselves or more, more commonly exporting of uh, chili sauces. Uh, that's become a big, big industry uh, for the Chinese. So I, I think it really, it, it comes with the sort of expansion of railroads and road networks see so the, the the chilies can be moved in in bulk more easily that happens i mean yes there's some of that happening in the 19th century but a lot of it's regional uh rather than a national network and that national network really doesn't take off until later in, in into the 20th century um and you're not now today you get chilies being grown. Uh, you can get fresh chilies year round because of greenhouses. And this is a huge, huge industry uh, all around most in, in the countryside, but, but sort of particularly around large cities, there's just lots and lots of, of greenhouses where they're growing fresh vegetables. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Fuchsia. Oh, hello, Brian, very nice to meet you. I found your book incredibly valuable and answered lots of questions for me. And, and I just wondered whether you could shed light on something that's always totally mystified me, which is um, that argument about the chili being useful for driving out unhealthy moisture and humidity. By the way, sorry about any background noise, but just that, um, you know, obviously apart from Sichuan and Hunan, which are terribly humid, so is Guangdong. And so are many areas of the Jiangnan. For example, among the full furnace cities, you have, um, you know, Chongqing, where they do eat lots of chilies, and you also have Nanjing, where they don't. And I yeah. just wondered, thinking again about one of the other things that you mentioned in your book that you haven't talked about, I think, today, but whether this is a kind of interaction with social snobbery and the fact that you have this sort of elitist Jiangnan region, you know, the idea that refined cuisine is very light and that peasant cooking is very hearty and spicy. And I know you touched on that because you, I think you said that one of the reasons that the chili took so long to appear in written sources you felt was because elites didn't think it was worth mentioning. But I just wondered whether you, you had some idea about why the, the moisture, the Chinese medicine explanation doesn't seem to apply in other humid areas. I, I, I mean, it is really confusing. Um, and, you know, Gua, Guangdong is a really good example. Super, super humid. I think partly there it's the ocean climate is just seen as, as somewhat different. Um, for the Jiangnan region, I, I agree. So the region around Nanjing, Shanghai, Suzhou, Hangzhou, 
that region is exactly this core of elite culture. Um, and that culture is definitely includes a milder cuisine. Um, and so I think that's part of what's going on there. Um, that, that aspect of the cuisine really skews any other sort of argument for, for introducing more chili peppers. So the, that cuisine, you know, pre-exists, it, it already is there prior to the 18th century, but really gets underscored as an important Chinese culinary tradition by the, the Qianlong Emperor who reigned for a big chunk of the 18th century. He's a huge, huge fan of Jiangnan cuisine. And that just made that you know, even more cachet for, for, that, for that cuisine. Um, and it, it, it's going to give it even more resistance to the chili pepper entering into it. Um, the, there's a number of elite traditions or, um, associated with Confucianism, and, and that would have been, that philosophy would have been really, really strongly instilled in the elite who would be the one in that region, who are the ones doing much of the writing about uh, cuisine at that period. And, and that includes the idea of they don't have the level of Veg eating vegetarian that you would have in, in Buddhism um, or Taoism, but they do have periods where you need to fast. And fasting for the Chinese in this context is not just avoiding meat, it's also avoiding strong flavors. And, and so that just reinforces that pre existing cultural, the, the culinary culture in that region. That, that I think causes them to, to resist the integration of the chilies. Um, I would point out, you know, if we look at the, as I'm sure you're very well aware, if we look at the 21st century, it's becoming, uh, particularly younger generations are much more open to eating chili peppers, even if they grew up in Guangdong or, or Nanjing. And, and there, I know a number of Chinese friends who say, oh, my parents can't eat spicy, but I, I really like to um, eat spicy. Um, and, and there's a big proliferation of Hunan, Sichuan restaurants throughout all, of, all over China. Thank you. Uh, when I did my uh, field work uh, for my doctoral research in Guangdong, about uh, 20 odd years ago, a lot of my elderly uh, interlocutors would uh, make a climactic argument. They, they, they would argue that actually the soils of Guangdong and especially the waters of the Pearl River Delta were themselves inherently heating. And therefore the Cantonese had to be especially wary of eating heating foods such as chili. So they avoided them like the plague. But there was also a moral dimension to their argument because they would associate then chili eating with uh, particularly with migrant workers from Sichuan and Hunan, who were seen often as being less civilized than the Cantonese themselves at the time. So um, I was just remembering also, actually, because in fact, even in Sichuan, of course, elite food is much milder. And, you know, Jianghu Tai, the kind of coarse workers' food, is much spicier. And in all regions, you get hotter food, don't you, in poorer sort of communities? Yeah. And that's actually true in Guangdong as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Clement, you have a question. Yeah, I was actually about to talk about uh, the spiciness <laughs> since um, you said there, you mentioned that um, the spread of the pepper and um, was more incorporated in the diets of uh, farmers. So was there initially um, kind of a rejection of the pepper as food uh, in upper social circles? And if so, uh, why, when did that stop and why did that stop? Um, yes, yeah, so they're, they're, they're definitely a rejection of it. Um, there's a number of uh, elite authors <clears throat> in the 17th, even 18th century, um, who talk about it as, as, as essentially as inedible. Um, it, it's so spicy, you can't actually eat it. Um, 
or it's so spicy, those who eat it are very few, which becomes a very classist uh, d description because we, we know a whole lot of farmers were eating them. Um, so, so yeah, there's a level at which they're, they're definitely rejecting it. Um, and for a whole host of reasons, and, and a lot of them that there's a, the, the classist uh, understanding of elites have a, a more subtle palate and, and we should be eating that subtle cuisine and, and the lower classes are the ones that eat that really spicy food. Uh, so the shift happens slowly. So a, a good example of this is um, uh, recipe books. So there's lots of recipe books. And of course, you know, until we get to the 20th century, it's, it's the elite who are writing these recipe books. Um, the, earliest recipe book to actually include chili peppers is the very end of the 18th century. Um, so once we get it into that, into that first uh, recipe book, we're starting to get elite adopting it. And then it's, it's gonna really take off in the later 19th century when we get the a, a really important um, medical text incorporates a, a, a large addendum that includes the chili pepper. And, and then the chili pepper is gonna, again, have a more cachet for the elite. Um, so I think part of the shift that happens for the elite is it just becomes harder and harder to ignore the chili pepper be, because it's just in all the, it's, it's sort of everywhere. And I do think you, you start to get local markets selling chili peppers um, in the late 18th, early 20th, I'm sorry, late 18th into the 19th century. But it's, 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 yeah, it's gonna be regional, very local trade, um, moving them from, from the rural area into the market towns, you know, not, not a trans-regional trade at that point. Um, and, I think it's, I think also as more and more medical texts are incorporating the chili pepper, it's recognized that they're also recognizing its importance as medicine, that, that those are sort of things, just recognizing it's, that it's there and recognizing that it can have some value is what's I think sort of finally breaking that barrier and, and, and getting more elite recognition. Um, but you know, you can still find that bias as, 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 as both um, Fuchsia and Jacob were just saying <laughs> that that bias can, can still, it still exists all the way up to the present. Uh, so just to uh, let people know, those who arrived a little bit late, um, if you have a question to ask, um, could you raise, a, raise your hand, use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen in the first instance? Um, if you'd rather type your question into the chat, that's okay too. Um, but it's, it, I prefer if you use the, the raise hand uh, function and then uh, ask your question out loud, if that's all right, if your Wi-Fi allows you to do that. Um, so we have a question from Nigel and then we have a comment in the chat as well, which I'll read out. Uh, thanks, Jacob. Um, yes, uh, I was just going back to the background section. You were attribute the uh, transfer of chilies from the Americas uh, to China to Columbus. And I just remember really enjoying um, Gavin Menzies' thesis, 1421, that the Chinese discovered the Americas for themselves by sending out a, a fleet uh, 70 years ahead of Columbus. And I was just going to ask, uh, does his thesis have any, any merit? And um, is it might it be possible that, um, that the, the Chinese took the chili back <laughs> directly uh, from the Americas, you know, not via European hands in a sort of uh, a colonial thesis, if you like? Sure. Um, no, <laughs> there is not actually any evidence that the Chinese uh, sailed to the San Francisco Bay in, in 1421. Um, the, there's some really good teardowns of, of Menzies' uh, uh, 
arguments and you know one of his arguments is that he found a previously unknown chapter from the Ming history that even though he doesn't read Chinese um, and that's part of his evidence for this. I, I feel like, so he is actually a British submarine captain and I feel like most of the routes that he shows are just routes that he happened to sail as a, as a submarine captain. Um, there's no evidence, you know, if the Chinese had brought the chili pepper back, why, why is our first record from 1591? Why isn't it from 1491? Um, and there's just no physical evidence of Chinese presence in, in the Americas on, on the West Coast of the US. You know, he has these various, um, Oh, there's this wooden structure that that's a, that's a Chinese vessel that's buried in the mud in the San Francisco, I think it's San Francisco Bay, and I'm waiting to hear back on the scientific testing of the wood, and you know, I don't know, we're 20 years on from his publication of his book, and we still don't have that that scientific analysis of it. It's an interesting concept. I mean, it's the I I, I should. I will point out, I, I, I think his main argument is that the Chinese could have done it, therefore they did. You know, he has a sub, I don't know if, hopefully maybe you haven't read, I haven't read the second, his second volume, which is the Chinese landed in Italy and started the Italian Renaissance. Um, so I don't know that, I think that tells you a lot right there <laughs> in terms of the believability of his, of his work. But thanks for the yeah for the question. So um, I'm going to take a, a read out a comment and then a question from the chat um, and then um, uh, leave it to Brian to uh, respond to those as he likes. So the first uh, comment is from Sandy Tang, saying, "Growing up in Macau, we were told to eat spicy. We were told uh, eating spicy food would propel the heat upwards, right? Shanghua or Songfu." Uh, interesting that it's the opposite for other regions of China. Uh, and then Monica Leung says, um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, have I'd like to ask if you've ever explored further the associations of chili pepper with maintaining beauty standards in addition to health. Growing up, I would hear my mom praise other girls and women for staying slim, jokingly saying that it was due to the fact that they liked eating spicy food. Uh, she doesn't, and nor did I at the time, although I love spicy food now. This, of course, has roots in the medicinal purposes and uses of the chili pepper throughout China, and such notions prevail despite the rise of the prioritization of Western medicine and beauty standards throughout the country. Um, you know, let me just make a, a quick comment to that second one. I mean, no, I have not actually encountered that one, but it's definitely something I'll be interested in, in, in pursuing. Because um, yeah, that would be an interesting additional sort of modern medical use of, of the chili pepper. Oh. Great, thank you. So we have a question. We have a question from Mark um, and then from uh, William, a former student of ours. Hello, um, my name is Mark. Um, I have a quick question about uh, the invention of mala flavor and the use of hua jiao in, uh, in, and how, who invented that combination? I heard that it was just a, a way to cover up bad smells when you were like cooking organ meat or something. So what are, uh, is there any like references in literature or something like that? Um, but this has been a very interesting uh, conversation. Thank you. Um. I'm probably gonna bounce this over to Fuchsia. Um, I think she might have a better answer. Um, I think it's probably happening pretty early. Um, and it's, so the mala is a combination of the indigenous Sichuan pepper, which has this ma or numbing characteristic with the la or the spiciness of the chili pepper. And it's very common in, um, Sichuan cuisine, but also used quite a bit in, in Yunnan as well. 
Um, so I think it's just a com combining a local indigenous pungent flavoring that they already have with the chili pepper. Um, some people, I think, not not Sichuanese, like to joke that you're use you're putting them together so that you have that numbing of your mouth, which allows you to eat more heat from the chili pepper. Uh, but I mean that's not really why they're why they're combining them. They're just an interest in combining the flavors. Um, I will point out that the that it's not it's important to understand that um, Europeans, Chinese were not using a ton of flavorings at any point to cover up bad food. Um, if, it, if the food's gone bad, it's still gonna impact your health. Um, and, and so it's, it's really not being used to cover up things. It's, it, it's just there for, for having a really strong flavor as well as potentially having medicinal values. But maybe Fuchsia, do you have any other insights for the combination of mala? Oh, maybe she had to leave. I think Fuchsia has had to leave already, I'm afraid. Great, uh, thank you. So uh, William, uh, good to see you, it's been a few years. Yeah, thank you very much, Jacob. And thank you very much, Brian. It's a really fascinating talk and a really good book as well, uh, which was well well worth the purchase and reading. Um, so I, I think what I've been finding really interesting about your talk, it correlates a lot with what I'm finding out whilst researching the UK chili pepper culture scene. Um, one of the questions I had was around sort of the naming of chili. So you kind of skipped over that slide, unfortunately. But in sort of, especially in England, um, we tend to label chilies uh, based on their heat level. So for example, like the real extreme varieties, like things like the Carol uh, Carolina Reaper, um, you have um, the Bedfordshire Brainstorm, and they're sort of denoting almost sort of the pain that it will cause you. Um, whereas sort of more mundane chilies are referred to sort of, you know, for example, like cayennes um, or lemon drops, they're referring to sort of the characteristics that the chili possesses. Um, I was wondering if you were, you found sort of correlations with um, how chilies were um, named in China, uh, whether it, you know, they, they it's necessary, necessary for them to have this sort of uh, danger label for lack of a better word. <laughs> Yeah, um, a lot of them have to do with the shape. So you've got chicken heart chili, goat horn chili. Um, so that, and, and then the way they're growing on the plant, uh, the pointing to heaven chili, or the, there's a recent one called the wrinkly chili. Um, so most of them don't have those intense names. I mean, you know, we do now, you know, you can get those exact same breeds now in China. And, and those ones are just gonna be more of a, a either a, a transliteration or a, a translation of, of those names. Um, that I, there is a little bit of a development of that sort of chili head culture in China, but I don't think it's as far developed as it is, I, I'm a little more familiar with it in the U.S., but I imagine there's a similar in the in the U.K. Um, and that, I, I mean, that's certainly not there prior to the late 20th, early 21st century. Um, so there is definitely it, it's important to for for the Chinese who are using a lot of chilies. The emphasis is is really on the flavoring rather than the heat. Um, and the, so that, the, you know, obviously somebody who's, who's not from Hunan or Sichuan and goes there and eats it probably isn't gonna be able to eat that cuisine, but they would are, you know, the natives would argue that, you know, they're not doing it entirely just for the heat. They're also seeking a particular flavor coming out of that. Um, I think when you know when you start getting the the one million on the on the Coville scale, I don't think there's any room to taste anything. Um, 
not I've, I, I haven't eaten once that, that insanely hot. Um, so I think that, I mean, there is a bit of culture developing in China where, you know, they will have these, some chili eating contests. Um, they, they have one that just sort of takes it up a notch where you soak in a hot spring filled with chilies and eat chilies. Um, and that just seems really crazy to me. <laughs> but, but anyway, yeah. Okay, so uh, we, we have a, a follow-up, which I'm going to take first from Mark, a uh, clarification to his earlier question. Uh, and then we have a question in the chat from Shirin. And I think Sarah had her hand up, perhaps, but she'll, she can verify that if, um, in a bit if she likes. Um, so uh, Mark, was uh, when he was talking about bad smells, he was referring specifically to uh, xing wei, which uh, oh, is okay. a fishy yeah. smell the smell from organ meat and so on, rather than necessarily food that had gone off. Um, so that was his follow-up. And then we have from yeah, yeah. Uh, Shirin Mirotra, um, incidentally, another um, former MA Anthropology of Food student. So those of you who don't know, I'm here at the SOAS Food Studies Center in the Anthropology Department at SOAS. We also, we run a, an MA program in the Anthropology of Food. So a lot of, this, a lot of the people here today are current students, and there's also several former students um, uh, in our in our seminar. Um, so, um, and Sharon's question is, Brian, I want to ask if you came across any literature that suggests that chilies came uh, to uh, to the northeast of India via China. Um, I haven't. There's. Um... It, it might be more likely the other way around um, that potentially the chilies went from, from Northeastern India into Yunnan, um, but there's no good evidence for that. Um, the, you know, the earliest records for, for chili peppers in Yunnan makes sense for them to have, have spread from the Chinese coast inland. Um, there's, I think it's quite likely that chili pepper spread from, you know, so that the Portuguese are initially introducing it in, in Goa. Um, and so one of the, I don't know any Indian languages, but I know one of, one of the names for chili in, in, in India is the Goan chili um, from that entry point. Um, and it certainly, almost certainly spread from Northeast India into the South Asian subcontinent uh, on, the, on the land, or, you know, could be also via, via vessels there. Um, but yeah, there's no, there doesn't, there's no good evidence for, for a passage um, either way between that sort of Southwest China and Northeast India. Although we, you know, there are certainly a lot of, a lot of trade and, and, and goods and ideas that did move through that area. Uh, so, uh, Sarah, did you have your hand up or um, you no longer? I, I no, no longer have my hand up because you sort of answered what I was going to ask about um, the chili bro culture. Um, but actually, seeing as I've got the mic, I just will ask a bit, a bit, <laughs> just a, a bit more about uh, about that and whether that is, uh, you know, that sort of obsession with the sort of the Scoville and sort of the chili festivals. And I was just wondering, is there what is there now um, a sort of conversation happening between that sort of American culture, chili culture, and um, yeah, and Chinese culture? And just, yeah, wondering where that sort of yeah to bring us right up to date. What's going on with chili culture in China? Um, I'm probably not the best one. <laughs> I am a historian. <laughs> so um, I've certainly been looking at, at more contemporary things, but I haven't, I have not yet been to any of these chili festivals in China. It's definitely something that I'd, I'd like to do as, as long as I don't actually have to soak in the hot tub filled with chilies. Um, but I, I do think that that I, I do think that type of chili culture is is coming from from the West. Um, and and then 
I think it's, you know, it's the idea that, you know, well, we obviously have been eating chilies for a really long time and we have this high tolerance, we should be able to be sort of competing or, or eating at that at a, at a similar level. So I think there's a, you know, there's a level of sort of cultural competition that, that's there as well as the sort of individual competition that would be happening in those contexts. So we have a we have a comment uh, adding to that from uh, William. You would want to look at the World Chile Alliance that has emerged in the past few years, interconnecting Chile festivals. It was created in China. Uh, and Mark tells us uh, there is some evidence that eating chilies can promote weight loss by reducing appetite and increasing fat burning. Um, I I have a a. a a question, if it's all right, if unless there's other hands at the moment, um, I guess we should probably begin to uh, wrap up fairly soon. Um, it kind of ties into Sharon's question about the spread of the chili, uh, to go back to that, uh, where you also started your paper. And I was wondering whether or to what extent the chili pepper spreads in China in some ways in parallel with or actually in together with uh, other um, crops from the Americas. And particularly, uh, I was thinking as a way of making them more palatable. Those crops such as maize, potatoes, uh, carbohydrate, carbohydrate, perhaps uh, sweet potato to, to the extent that it is arriving at around the same time as well. I guess there's some debate about that. But um, to, you know, to what extent they're arriving together. So the chili pepper is something which is helping farmers who are producing, growing uh, these new crops to feed themselves so they can grow other things for market. They're then using the chili to make them more palatable. Is there anything in that at all? Um, um, I, I think it's a reasonable, I mean, so definitely we can see them spreading together. Um, so I, I don't think I ever found chilies in a local history where I didn't find at least one of those other crops from the Americas. Um, maize in particular seems, seems like a, if I found maize, the likelihood of my finding chilies later in the in the in that passage would seem more likely. Um, and if I didn't find maize, I seemed a little less likely to find chilies. It's I you know I don't just I don't have enough data to be able to make a really strong correlation, but it definitely the earliest known uh, written sources for most of the other American crops are actually earlier than, than the chili pepper. Tobacco would be one that's, that's a little bit later. Um, and this makes sense because these are ones that get a lot of attention from elite writers because of their high caloric content. Um, so there's, it seems like every other literati has my essay on the sweet potato and none of them wrote my essay on the chili pepper, which was very frustrating. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think they're, they're spreading uh, in, in, in parallel anyway. Um, and I do think there's a good argument to be made that, they, that it adds a better, a, a strong, you know, more of a flavor to some of these really carb rich or, or starchy rich um, foods like maize or, or, or the white potato. Um, I don't, unfortunately don't have an author saying, oh yes, and, and it's important to add chilies in order to be able to eat your, your potatoes. And part of that of course is again, a classist aspect of the, of the authors being elite members Maize and, and potato were definitely seen as a lower class food, and and they're def and and particularly promoted. Even though they're promoted by the elite, they're not promoting them for themselves. They're promoting them as a food that can help the poor make it through famines. Great, thank you so much. Uh, well, I guess I think it's 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 quarter to. Uh, uh, eight, uh, sorry, uh, uh, quarter to seven over here um, in uh, in Britain, um, and we've had we've uh, had a wonderful seminar for an hour and a half, and 
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Brian, for a, a fabulous paper and a wonderful conversation. And thanks everybody for uh, joining us.